And so before we continue to submerge into our inheritance that God has written into his word with which he created all things and keeps all things, the unchanging epigraph of the study of the word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so we, as partakers of the body of Christ, share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture. We shall continue the study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit, what we need to do from our side so that we receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so that we can put on the new man or new form of life. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. To honor this needed for life and required command commandment we are given three fundamental requirements. This is <coughs> to put off, be renewed, and put on. And not looking at the fact that we don't see the methods or the means of utilizing and renewing ourselves with the spirit of our mind and being clothed into the new person. Your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting questions will depend on whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath. In other words, will our salvation be completed, the salvation that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it? And furthermore, our names then be blotted out of the book of life, although they may have been written there previously. In a, per, in a particular format, we have already studied two questions <coughs> and have been studying the next. What conditions are to be fulfilled that by the means of an already renewed mind we begin the process of being dressed or clothed into the abilities of our new person, created in accordance to God in Jesus Christ in righteousness and holiness and truth. We note that our new man or new person in which we need to be dressed or clothed is our inner or sacred person born from the imperishable seed of the Word of God, that by nature is righteous, holy, unwilting, and immortal. And although it is temporarily within this mortal body, it continues in the spiritual world, the unseen world. And so our new person carries within itself eternity within time and does not depend from the time and governs the time. As it looks at the unseen, lives with the unseen, and strives for the unseen, and calls the not existent in this present time, the inheritance of Christ, as existent, confesses with with her mouth, the treasury of faith that is written upon the tablets of her heart, the unperishable treasure that is waiting to be revealed. The right to be able to be dressed into our new person is the ability to rule over time, and this right is linked to the fulfillment of commandments uh, that explain in what way and what time we are to dress ourselves into the new person. Ecclesiastes 8, 5 through 7. He who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful, and a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment, because for every matter there is a time and judgment. Though the misery of a man increases greatly, for he does not know what will happen, so who can tell him when it will, will occur? A person does not know what a commandment what commandment has or includes the time and this condition or command. <clears throat> the truth, searching the scriptures from beginning to end, being inspired by the Holy Spirit to be able to see how to do something. Based upon this place of scripture and others, we can conclude that without the ability to rule over time, that is following the commandments and understanding time and judgment is not able to, we are not able to be dressed into the garments of righteousness to perform the perfect justice of God. Understanding the qualities of our new person, we had decided to study the process of being dressed 
thrust into our new person from seven angles or seven qualities, although there are many more of them. <clears throat> and so a new, the new person is a person arrayed in a robe of salvation, clothed into the garments of righteousness, crowned with a crown of a groom, decorated with items for a bride, a person with wedding clothes, clothed in fine and bright linen, accepting the representing power of Yahweh of hosts. Studying these virtues, we noted that all of these virtues are contained in one, the other. They find themselves one in the other, come one from the other, support one the other, and serve as confirmation of the truthfulness of one the other. In one of the places of Scripture, Isaiah 61, 10, 11, we discovered immediately four of those virtues or qualities. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, that's four. For as the earth brings forth its bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God shall cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Isaiah 61, 10, 11. This is the truth and glory of God, and He shall reveal them before all the nations when He will be dressing us into these things, when we collaborate with Him to dress ourselves into this new person, the garments, the robe of salvation, garments of righteousness, crown of a groom, items for a bride, and so forth. We note that the unity of these worthinesses and qualities in a single person, and especially the qualities of the crown of the groom and the items of a bride, are truly beyond the abilities or understandings of our mind. In this prophecy, these worthinesses grown by God within the heart of a man are just the same as the earth that yields its plantation and grows that what is grown in it or sown into it. Joy in the Lord as one of the characteristic identifying the kingdom of heaven in the heart of a man is called to identify the, uh, the, the fruit that this person bears in his good heart. And the result of it is the glorious harvest that yields in his heart the kingdom kingdom of heaven that has come into strength that previously was sown in tears as it is written psalm 126 5 6 those who sow in tears shall reap in joy he who continually goes forth weeping bearing seed for sowing shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him being dressed into the new person is being dressed into the resurrection of christ that is the fruit that we bear to god the fruit of the spirit we bear to god that is called to identify within our heart the order and power of the abiding kingdom of heaven in us in righteousness peace and joy the Holy Spirit. In a particular format, we have already studied the robe of salvation and have been studying the garments of righteousness, and in part, the condition or price that is to be paid for the right to be clothed into the garments of righteousness, that dress us into the abilities and to perform the uh, justice of God. We studied six conditions and have been studying the seventh condition. This is putting on redemption by honoring the Lord's Pesach in accordance to the conditions placed by him. John 6, 53 through 58. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed. It's talking here about the teaching of the truth of the blood of Christ and the truth of the cross of Christ. And so when a person eats the communion and is not familiar with the teaching, he eats judgment to himself. My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. <clears throat> that essence of eating the Pesach of the Lord worthily is knowing through the instruction of faith how to collaborate with the truth of the blood of Christ and the truth of the cross of Christ. That opens to us access to our inheritance. If a person through the instruction of faith will not be taught these two fundamental truths that are the root of the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, then he will not have any ability 
to worthily take part in the communion of the Lord. Every the detail, every detail of the celebration of Pesach, worthily eating the communion of the Lord or the Pesach of the Lord, this was represented the final deliverance from sin and death in the body of a person. And in future, the final deliverance of the mortal body itself and the mortal soul that due to worthily eating the lamb Pesach in its time will be dressed into immortality. In the conditions of Pesach, we see requirements of garments and clothing that we were to put on to that testified of our ability to perform God's justice and requirements of eating the lamb itself. Not following these requirements in any of its aspects did not deliver a person from a verdict of death. And the opposite, following the requirements of Pesach, made a person a part of the judgments of God over the firstborn of Egypt. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Exodus 12.12 12. Based on this statement of Scripture, we see that the firstborn of Egypt from which the Egyptians depended are the gods of Egypt. Our dependence from whatever or whoever identifies our God, our hope, and our worship. Because if a person says that he loves God and depends from God, but at the same time depends from money or from alcohol or from or jealousy or from greed or from any other destructive desires or sins, then he deceives himself. That which we depend from is our worship and our God. The firstborn of Egypt are the symbol of the soul of a person that has refused to lose itself in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, to die for its nation, for its house, and its personal desires and considerations that are opposite to God's preferences. When a child of God accepts Christ, they are still people of the flesh at that time. And if they will not deny their soul in and agree to lose it in the death of Jesus Christ, die for their nation, their house, and their desires, they for themselves will become gods. They will begin to worship their intellect, their understandings, their interpretation, saying, I don't understand this way, I don't see this way. They will not be a part of the body of Christ where there will be a unity of mind that will come from one head, from one person that God has placed over all of them. How can we have a unity of mind? We are all individual and we see things differently and each one may have its their own opinion and when they say a person cannot have their own opinion you know how people of the flesh become angry what we don't have our own head Wait, why are you the only head no I am not the only head the only head is Jesus Christ of his body and every church he has his representative and only in this way can we be of unity of mind uh, leveling out or correcting our thoughts and our way of seeing by what Jesus speaks through them. And so if we will not perform God's ju judgment and justice over our soul following the Lord's Pesach in accordance to his conditions, we will not be able to be descendants of the faith of Abraham, that is the father of all people of faith. And we will not be able to be then dressed into the garments of righteousness, that is our new or sacred person. He will then die in us. Abraham was placed by God uh, as an example for his people and he was placed as a seed of the priest word and he called the non-existent as existent and grew the seed into the fruit of joy which was Isaac. The celebration of Pesach in the skin's garments that the Lord had made for, Abraham, uh, for Adam was planned by God to be the blessed destiny for only those people that were preordained and planned by God to be saved that had chosen this.
Worthily eating the lamb Pesach, the Lord was able to fulfill all of his oaths and promises, and that included performing his judgment over his enemies. That is, the unclean of the world that were previously holy and then rejected or refused to die in the, de- in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ transformed themselves into the unclean and began to mock his, uh, God's chosen people, belittling poverty and all kinds of sicknesses, weaknesses that hurt his people. And for the imperishable treasures of the celebration Pesach that contain in itself you being part of the family of God and righteousness of God to be our inheritance, the scriptures have required us to fulfill ten conditions or more accurately to abide within these ten conditions. The selection and separation of the Passover lamb, removing all the leaven from the house, applying blood upon the doorposts, roasting the entire lamb on the fire, girding yourself with a belt, to put shoes on your feet, take your rod in your hand, eat the entire lamb, eat the lamb with unleavened breads and bitter herbs, and eat it in haste. In the previous services, we had already studied the nine (coughs) previous uh, and have been studying the tenth and the triumphant and concluding component where we see the redemption of God and that redemption was to be victorious over death and sin. The requirement to eat the lamb Pesach in haste or with haste Exodus 12 11 and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist your sandals on your feet your staff in your hand so you shall eat it in haste it is the Lord's Passover the element of haste when you eat the Passover of the, of the Lord it was so important that it more than once is mentioned in scripture as an unchanging law and this element was used when the Israelites came out of Egypt and this element was elevated into uh, special significance in scripture and was a sign of the circumcision of our heart and our ear the element of haste it, it ex- reveals itself in the circumcised ear and circumcised heart You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. Deuteronomy 16.3 the word haste, besides its direct definitions within time to be to hurry up, not be late, in the level of spirit, it has a very different set of definitions, as we know. The word haste means to take the yoke of Christ upon yourself, carry your cross, overcome suffering, be dressed within a mantle of a learner, be dressed into the armor of light and the power of the teaching of Christ, or in other words, be strengthened with all of his might according to this glorious power. Renew your mind, meditate about the laws of the Most High, pay attention to the Word with fear and trembling, and stand guard, not peddling the Word of God. Considering that eating Pesach is a guarantee of the New Testament that symbolically is in the number 8, as in the 8th day they circumcised a child, considering these things we had decided to study eight meanings of eating the Pesach of the Lord in haste, although there are many more of them. In a particular format, we have already studied six of those meanings that identify haste when you worthily eat the lamb Pesach and have been studying the seventh meaning. And this is strength, being strengthened with all might according to the glorious power of God with patience and long suffering with joy. Colossians 1.11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all, for all patience and long suffering with Christ. We know that in scripture, all of the strength of God with which we need to be strengthened, eating the lamb pesic of the Lord in haste, have very many definitions that are contained in the many works that he does that will reveal his glory. In Hebrew, strength means might, power, the right, authority, dominion, covenant, light, a sign, direction, attributes of royal power, the all armor of God, heavenly hosts or armies, elements and challenges of the universe, the many mercies and goodnesses of God, the greatnesses and magnificence of God, the mightiness and strength of God, the abilities and opportunities to perform judgment and righteousness, the ability to expand and widen 
a miracle, a miraculous work, and a surprise. We know that only when we collaborate with the specific strengths of God that are working within us and through us, we can have evidence that we are eating the Pesach of the Lord in haste, giving us the ability to confront the ambitions of our personal Egypt. Therefore, to be strengthened with all of the strengths of God by the might of His glory, it is necessary to fulfill one condition, and that is to abide in all patience and long-suffering with joy. To be able to abide in all patience and long-suffering with joy, we need to learn what we need to understand when talking about all the strength of God contained within the might of His glory, and only after research how to abide in all patience and long-suffering and joy, to strengthen ourselves with the many different types and many strengths of God. Otherwise, how will we strengthen ourselves with these strengths if we don't know what they are? Studying the first questions, what do we, what do we need to understand when we talk about the, all the strengths of God that are contained within the might of His glory, we came to the conclusion that the first and the many meanings and many functions of the strengths of God identify the many works or deeds of God. Psalm 66.3 Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. Here it's talking about the many works that he does. They're done by his many strengths. And because of this, the enemies submit themselves to him. And of course, our main enemy that is required to obey us when we collaborate with the many strengths of God is our soul that in nature is linked to its nation, its house, and its genetical preferences and desires, behind which stand the many powers of hell. The many works or deeds of God that are done within our heart by the many strengths of God in seep fear and reverence before God. God, of course, if they are within the heart of a person and do God's work. And such results are called to be experienced in the life of every individual person that eats the Pesach of the Lord in haste. Therefore, in the many meanings and many functions of the strength of God, we see the great work of God's redemption that reveal to us who God is for us and what God has done for us. And the question, in what way are we to be strengthened with the many strengths of God, reveals to us what we need to do from our side to inherit all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Therefore, in a particular format, we have already looked at some of the definitions that identify the nature and character of the specific strengths of God that He has done in His people and through His people. And I've been studying the next component of the strength of the Lord that is called to be revealed in the heart and through the heart of a redeemed by God man in the many mercies and goodnesses of God. The mercies, mercies and goodnesses of God are specific strengths of God. Psalm 5.7 but as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercies. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. The many mercies of God are the strengths of God, where he says, by the many strengths of yours, I will enter and worship toward your holy temple. Because every strength of God has a specific face, specific character, and we're studying here the strength of God in the many mercies of God. And so by the means of the many strengths of God revealed in the many or much of his mercy to enter into the house of God, it is necessary that our heart obtain the right not only to possess and collaborate with these strengths, but also the right to abide in these strengths. And such a right to possess and abide in the strengths of God that are revealed in the much mercies of God is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is called to use or utilize and lead these strengths after itself to blot out our lawless deeds before the face of God. And so the fear of the Lord is the war captain of God's mercies. Let's read this place of Scripture, Psalm 51, 1 through 10. <clears throat> One of the greatest prayers that I again and again recommend for myself as well as you, that we just open the Scriptures and begin to pray this prayer and 
the next ones, of course, that we will read as well. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and I do and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother received me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Psalm 51, 1 through 10. And although admittance of your lawless works before God is an important step for God to blot out our lawless lawlessness or blot our lawlessness out, because God, God will justify our sins and blot them out, in order for God to blot out our lawless works, just admitting your lawless works before God is not enough. Because to blot out our lawlessness, it is necessary to collaborate with the many strengths of God that is with his mercy that is contained in the inheritance of the blood of the cross of Christ, specifically the unique collaboration with the many mercies of God that are revealed in his innumerable kindnesses or goodnesses begins the creation of his mercy that identifies haste when we eat Pesach. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. The fact is, only after our sins are blotted out, collaborating with the many mercies of God, we become worthy of God and receive the right to enter before the face of the Lord to establish His interest in His perfect justice. Therefore, to perform the justice of God, it is vital for us that mercy and truth be binded around our necks and that our, these virtues be written upon the tablets of our heart and become the state of our heart. Proverbs 3, 3, 4. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. We note that the symbol of the neck that we are needing to bind with mercy and truth, because this is a parable, is the collaboration of our sovereign will with the sovereign and perfect will of God. Upon practice, this means submit into obedience your will to the perfect will of God written in Scripture. At the same time, the requirement to write mercy and truth upon the tablets of your heart means to collaborate our wise heart with the wise heart of God. Upon practice, this means prepare the soil of your heart to receive the seed of the preached word about the kingdom of heaven. Only in this way, when we prepare our heart to listen to the word of God, God then places into our heart something, his word, his truth. Exodus 31, 6, I have put wisdom in the heart of all the crafted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you. Therefore, the teaching of mercy that is revealed in the redemption of God, with which we are to bind our neck, can express itself in no other way but only strictly within the boundaries the right of the right teaching identified as the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. <laughs> and not the creation of made-up teachings and ideas of pseudo-religious teachings and ideas or personal ideas of our intellect that have no right or ability to understand or comprehend the truth of the Word of God. And so for God to be able to turn upon us His golden scepter, that is His favor, due to which we will then receive the right to establish His justice over the righteous and the unrighteous, the worthiness of mercy in truth is called to become not just the possession of our heart, but the state of our heart as well, that would serve as the identification of the kingdom of heaven within our heart. <coughs> we had 
decided to refresh in our mind the uh, questions, what character do the scriptures give the mercy of God, which is a manifestation of his many strengths that identify the favor or goodwill of God towards man in the image of his scepter? What purpose does fulfilling the many forms of God's strength and his mercy called to have in our worship what price is necessary to be paid so that the many mercies of God become our possession and our state and by what results do we judge that God truly has stretched forth his many t- mercies that is his golden scepter that has given us his many strengths studying the first question what characteristics do the scriptures give the quality of the mercy of God that is a manifestation of his many strengths we came to the conclusion that the mercy of God as it is is one of the fundamental names of God as well as one of his character virtues 2 Corinthians 1 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies and God of all comfort Second, the mercy of the Lord is the inheritance of God that is passed down exclusively to his children as heirs of the the faith of Abraham from one righteous generation to another righteous generation from a father to a son. The mercy of the Lord in its status is beyond the life in the flesh because it is better than the life in the flesh. Fourth, the mercy of the Lord is one of the many forms of expression of God's goodness expressed in in His grace that reigns in the heart of a person through righteousness that a person previously received freely by that very grace redemption in Christ Jesus. Fifth, the mercy of the Lord that is in the goodness of God is one of the identifications and manifestations of the truth of God that is intended for the vessels of mercy that walk in the truth truth. Psalm 89, 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. This place of scripture is unique, is that this person praising God due to his goodness has the right to praise him within the boundaries of the truth, talking about the fact that this person that was praising God and lifting him up, lifting up his goodness, abides within God's goodness and keeps himself from falling from the faith. Romans 11.22 Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those of false severity, but towards you goodness if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. In this place of scripture, the goodness of God is the demonstration of mercy and truth, covering those people that have bound their neck with mercy and truth. The severity of God is the expression of just judgment that is stretched forth over those people who have refused to bind their neck with mercy and truth. The scripture called these people hard-hearted. Psalm 88, 15. If we will not prepare our heart to obey and listen to the mercy and truth, then we will not have any opportunity to turn God's favor upon us. As it is written, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Romans 10.16. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hearing the word of God is from those people that God sends, not those that we vote for or those who place themselves. The means of accepting any help, that is the mercy of God, as we know, is prayer or worship in spirit and in truth. Because prayer is nothing else but the right that a person gives for heaven to then take part in his life and you give God the right based upon God's conditions. One of these prayers of David written in the 143rd Psalm of David, he allows God to take part in his life and to do work in his heart. This will be the subject or has been the subject of our study. Let's read this psalm. Once, uh, I also recommend that we pray this prayer also. 
Psalm 143, 1-12 through 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give me your ear to my supplication. In your faithfulness, answer me and... In your righteousness, do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness, like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit it fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. <coughs> Psalm 143, 1 through 12. In order to study the strength that is the mercy of the Lord <coughs> in this place, in this prayer, it was necessary for us to understand the reasons for why the, uh, David brought forth this prayer to God. The reason for why David prayed such a prayer was the specific category of enemies that confronted David, the personal flesh of David that uh, prompted him to sin. He had sinned, he had killed the husband of, <clears throat> uh, uh, of Bathsheba. This is the personified sin and personified death that stands behind the flesh of David as well as each one of us. To be heard by God for David as well as us, he needed to present specific evidence of the right uh, that would be evidence before God <clears throat> uh, for why God is, would be able to take part in his life and do work in his life. <clears throat> From David's side, such evidence were ten things. There were ten forms of evidence that David brought before God. He said, Hear me in your faithfulness and in your righteousness. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I spread out my hands to you, for in you do I trust. I lift up my soul to you. In you I take shelter, and not to someone or something, for you are my God. Hear me, for you are my God. Hear me for your name's sake. Hear me for your righteousness' sake. Hear me, for I am your servant. <laughs> In the previous services, we had been studying the first uh, form of evidence that gave God the right to take part in David's life to confront his enemies. This is the faithfulness and righteousness that abided in his heart. And this was the work of God's redemption in the life of David. Let's see what David says in another psalm, Psalm 66, 18 through 20. For I regard iniquity, in, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be, be God who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. If David no, would not have uh, prayed the this prayer within the boundaries of faithfulness and righteousness, God would not have heard him uh, in confronting these enemies, his person of personal flesh and the personified sin and personified death. And to be able to lift up your prayer within the boundaries of truth and or faithfulness and righteousness, it is necessary that our sins be blotted out before the face of God and blotted out so much that we not see them in our heart. David said, if I would have it regarded iniquity in my heart, committing such a terrible sin, he did not see this iniquity in his heart. The sin did not come from his heart, it came from outside. It was as a stranger. Prophet Nathan came and showed uh, David how the sin came to him. He was walking upon the roof of his, of his house, 
although he was not supposed to be there at that time, he was supposed to be in battle uh, fighting. <clears throat> when we're doing not what we need uh, to be doing, we always fall into uh, trouble. And he saw a bathing woman. She was uh, uh, uncovered and she was the wife of one of his captains and he asked a, that she be brought to him and she he laid with her and she uh, became pregnant and he finds out and he calls this captain to himself and he asks that she he go to his house uh, and and sleep with his uh, be with his wife and and take some time to be with his wife and be in his house this captain, it was his intention, David's intention, in order to cover up what has been done. But this captain really loved David and loved God, and he said, no, I will not go home. When the servants of my king are, are fighting, I cannot go and be at home. And so David sees that it's not working, and so he sends a letter to one of his other soldiers telling him to place Uriah in, a, in one of the dangerous uh, places or a dangerous position in battle so that he be killed, and he was. And he then sent a letter back that, uh, saying that Uriah had died. And David says it's okay that the sword sometimes kills one or the other. And then God sent prophet Nathan to him. I'm just uh, showing this story or explaining, uh, talking about these things because there are people that will not be chosen by God because they did not, did not die. Uh, for their personal ambitions, uh, saying, how could God have forgiven this man for what he had done? Uh, Prophet Nathan said, there was a man who had many uh, sheep, and there was another poor man who had just one little ewe lamb. And, and he had a visitor, this rich man with the many sheep, and instead of slaughtering one of his own sheep, he took the only one little ewe lamb this man had and slaughtered it. And David said, he needs to die. And Nathan says, King, this is you. King David immediately said, he had he said, I need to die. And Nathan told him, you will not die because the Lord had taken your sin away. But David knew, realized what he had done. But the sin did not come from his heart. In the, for, from the unclean people, the sin comes from the heart. People, if they're not vigilant, the people of God, they're, they, they're somewhere not vigilant. Sin can come from outside and can inspire, prompt your emotions some, or your lust or, or some kind of anger, some kind of uh, something else. Uh, but David said, if I would have regarded iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not hear hear me. Prayer needs to be brought to God so that heart not have anything lawless in it. And so he says not to see this lawlessness in himself. First, not to see this iniquity or lawlessness in our heart. Our heart needs to be cleansed from dead works by the means of our collaboration with the truth that reveal the blood of Jesus, uh, the abilities of the blood of Jesus Christ. We're talking about people that admit and leave their sins and receive the redemption of God as a gift of the redeeming grace of God. Psalm 32, 1, 2, a psalm of David, a contemplation. Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not input iniquity, and who, in whose spirit there is no deceit. And so in our ba prayer battle, to be able to confront our enemies, we need our heart to abide within God's boundaries. And in order to have this happen, we needed to study uh, 
how David was able to so boldly present the evidence that he did, that he is within the boundaries of the truth and the faithfulness and righteousness of God, how he was able to receive this uh, position on, and what conditions he needed to fulfill to have these qualities in his life. To respond to this question and receive the ability to uh, destroy our old self or old nature behind which stands personified sin and death and be dressed within our new person, identifying the garments of righteousness, we needed to look at a series of questions. This is identifying faithfulness and righteousness in our heart. What purpose does faithfulness and righteousness fulfill in our heart? How to keep our heart in faithfulness and righteousness? And what results follow from knowing faithfulness and righteousness? The boundaries within which we can turn God's favor upon us in His mercy or within boundaries where we can collaborate with the many tr strengths of God that are reflected in His mercies. Studying the first two questions, what or who is faithfulness and righteousness in their essence as well as their definition, as well as what purpose is faithfulness and righteousness called to fulfill in our heart before God, we came to the conclusion that faithfulness and righteousness are not to be looked at as twins, although one is similar to the other just as a daughter is similar to her mother or son is similar to his father. In Scripture, faithfulness comes from righteousness. In other words, speaking faithfulness is produced from righteousness, just as a father produces his son or a family parents yield their fruit children from which we can conclude that faithfulness is the root that identifies the state of the human heart at the same time righteousness or justice as well as fairness is the tree that grows from this root revealing what is what it's made of <clears throat> based on this fairness or righteousness is truth in action or the result of what faithfulness produces in our heart. Therefore, to perform judgment and righteousness, that is, or what is just, it is necessary to possess in your heart a particular truth that would identify the state or condition of your heart. And this state or condition needed to be obtained is no other way, in no other way but through the genetical inheritance that we that we would inherit solely by the line of Abraham that God made to be the father of all who believe those who are circum circumcised as well as those that are not circumcised. <clears throat> because the work of justice, as it is, can come only from the heart of a person that is born from the seed of the word of truth, and in whom is the truth or the truth abides. Therefore, the kind of heart a person has, that is what he will perform, because from a good heart in which there is truth, the righteousness of God comes in God's judgments that show mercy to the vessels of mercy and wrath from the vessel for the vessels of wrath. And this, at the same time, an evil heart where there is an absence of truth, evil comes that defiles a person and members him <clears throat> to the category of the vessels of wrath. Considering that we are take, talking about people that think of themselves as a category of the un that think of themselves as the category of the righteous when they are actually the category of the unclean and unrighteous. <clears throat> Collaborating with the righteousness and faithfulness of God, we can blot out our sins before the face of God. Answering the third question, how do we keep ourselves within faithfulness and righteousness or conditions are to be fulfilled that our heart abide within faithfulness and righteousness? We came to the conclusion that in military there's a specific uh, saying to be able to uh, conquer or overtake the heights of our enemy is very difficult. And so to be able to receive faith or to have the faith that we have in Jesus Christ, we need... 
to be poor in spirit, because kingdom of heaven is given to the one who is poor in spirit. To keep this righteousness, you need to perform righteous works. Or to, to be able to perform righteous works, you need to be righteous. The first component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness that we've already studied, faithfulness and righteousness is accepting the delegated authority of God placed, placed for us. Second component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is payment to know the truth about redemption. Third component of, of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is the wise and willing decision to forgive the offenses that have been done against you before the setting of the sun. The fourth component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is a complete separation from Babylon. The fifth component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness it is the necessity to believe in the promises of God. The sixth component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is to be ready to have a relationship with God as a spouse. These six we already studied, somewhat stu studied them. The seventh component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is fulfillment of the revelations of the truth of God accepted in the heart, into the heart of a person in the good news of Christ that reveals itself as faith moves it from within the heart, its goal being another faith that is present in the air upon the clouds. Romans 1.17 For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith. So here we see if you look in the original from faith from faith to faith the faith from in, in within and this faith comes and greets an, another faith. And so righteousness revealed in the heart of a man is a specific principle upon which a man dresses himself into the resurrection of Christ, which is the fruit of his spirit, identifying his new person in righteousness and holy truth. In this specific place of scripture, I repeat, in the original Greek language, in the revelation of the righteousness of God, we see two types of faith or two types of information that greet each other and collaborate with each other because faith is information faith is from hearing the word of God there are two types of information or, or, or faith the first type is the truth that comes from the heart of a man and greets the second type of faith that comes down from heaven Psalm 85, 9 through 13. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. <coughs> Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the out of the earth. This is that faith, faith to faith, the revealing of of truth, dressing yourself into the new person from faith to faith. Truth shall spring out of the earth from the heart of a person and grows, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. And what happens? Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. <laughs> Understanding from faith to faith, they think from that you come from one faith into another faith. Here it's talking about meeting or greeting of one faith with another. Faith is information of God, the information of God, the word of God. It comes as truth to a person, as righteousness, and this truth grows. The obedience of a person to the words of God, this is the faith of a person. And when it goes, uh, you it's the greeting of two faiths, the faith of a man with God's faith. <clears throat> the eighth component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is receiving circumcision as a seal of righteousness that it we obtained before circumcision. Romans 4.11 And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Romans 4.11 
Circumcision is, is a symbol of being baptized by water, the Holy Spirit, and fire, in which we submerge into the death of Christ and make a covenant of blood, a covenant of salt, and a covenant of peace with God. And if in the Old Testament the circumcision of the foreskin served as a sign of the covenant, it served as evidence before God that you are a part of the chosen by God nation and evidence that you keep his covenant. Genesis 17.14 And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. In the New Testament, the symbol of the foreskin is the tongue of a person. And so the tongue is the seed he's able to to sow and so the new testament in the new testament the symbol of the of the foreskin is the tongue of of a person with which he being baptized by water made a covenant with god therefore in the new testament the sign of the covenant that could serve before god as evidence of you being a part of his chosen nation and evidence that you keep his covenant are new lips and so we talk about the renewed mind but renewed mind happens through the mouth or through your lips and so if your mouth or lips are un unrestrained they cannot collaborate God, the Lord cannot collaborate with an unrestrained mouth and so you need to prepare as this, this new lips are a, sign, are a symbol in scripture of new fields or new lands Jeremiah 434 for thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem break up your your fallow ground do not sow among thorns circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings <clears throat> to be able to fallow the ground is is, and so these new fields or new lands, you need to be able to prepare them, su subdue them, and you, you prepare them, you fluff them, and you proclaim with your mouth the faith of your heart, which is based upon the principles of the new covenant. Specifically, proclaiming with our mouth the faith of our heart will depend on whether you keep God's ju uh, justification. Matthew 12, 36, 37, But I say to you that for every idle word, idle word is uh, any bad word that is not in accordance to the will of God. For every idle word man may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. People will be saved based on their own confessions. They hear the word, but they confess not the word, but the uh, circumstances in which they are in currently, the feelings that are overcoming them. The faith of the heart is a sign of circumcision that is revealed in the confession of your mouth. And so the faith of of the faith of your, uh, the confession of the faith of your heart is pretty much as a marriage. Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. <laughs> and so it is necessary to have a circumcised ear which is a sign of humility and it is also a sign of a, the poverty of spirit or bankruptcy. If we want to have a, a new tongue or two mouth or a new mouth, or a new tongue, it is necessary to humble yourself. That's what it says in Acts 7.51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. If the ear and the heart is not circumcised, he will not uh, work with the Holy Spirit. He will actually uh, work with the opposite, and he will he he will hear the correct confessions, but they these will not be in his heart. He will not have acceptance of the person that God has placed over him, uh, and a person will have a hard heart. He will not be able to confess God's truth. He will confess. He will only confess something only when uh, he really needs something. He'll take the Bible and says, "I take by faith healing." because I am sick, I confess uh, with the faith of my heart, but you will, and you will say you believe, you will believe, but it's not in your heart. 
And even when he ends up in hell, he'll say, I don't need to be here because I confess the faith. But these faith need to meet, to, these two forms of faith need to meet together, as you remember, one that comes from above and one coming from your heart. But he heard the one coming from above, but it did not come from his heart. He uh, spoke his needs as faith. The faith of God is the uh, that which is coming into your heart through the instruction of faith from the preaching. But not all have listened, uh, Prophet Isaiah says. Who, who, had, who will believe our report? The ninth component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is the ability to find ourselves in God or place yourself into Christ, not with your own righteousness that is from the law, but with the one that is through faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Philippians 3, nine, And be found in him, it's talking about Jesus, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. In this place of scripture, we see two forms of righteousness that come and are based upon two forms of covenants, the old covenant and new covenant, where a person can uh, find himself depends on which covenant you place yourself and f what form of righteousness you consider. Righteousness from, the w from your works or righteousness by faith. It's talking about finding yourself in Jesus Christ in the performance of righteousness and God's justice that is to be done within the boundaries of the New Testament. By the works of the law, Romans 3, 20 through 25. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now that right, righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And so when people say that right now I'm going to preach the gospel, I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to rebuke demons, I'm going to practice the gifts of the Holy spirit and I'll be saved you can do all of this out of carrying the cross you can do all of this out because people do not want to accept over themselves God's order they don't want to be humble and they do all those things and so Jesus will need to say in his time I do not know you how do you not know us uh, we rebuked demons in your name but because you used my name that is why you will go to hell you did not have the right to use my name in these things because the holy goals are to be done or to be reached by holy means. You did this for yourself. No one sent you. You sent yourself and sent each other. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a proprietation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Romans 3, 20 through 25. And so how can, as people that were under the law, as well as people out of circumcision, out of the law, the one and the other committed a sin, God includes all in that same uh, group. All had sinned and all were supposed to be condemned. But we receive, as it says, this righteousness because his forbearance, in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Romans 3, 20 through 25. And so this is a very deep truth that can, could make a person happy if he would have meditated upon them and written upon them upon his heart, then there it would have been singing inside. He would have had hope and hell would not be able to condemn him. Nobody would be able to condemn him. Hell would condemn and others would condemn, but he would just have song in his heart because upon the tablets of his heart, I am justified freely by the grace in the redemption of Jesus Christ, the Lord has not accounted my sins or because I've received justification freely. He does not consider sins that any sins upon me or towards me. 
It is very uh, upsetting or so, uh, sad that as if out of the law of Moses, people are still trying to establish everything on their, uh, uh, on their deeds or their works. I practice the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I do this, I do this, I do this. And they're always saying what they're doing. But here, it's not talking about what you're doing, but what God has done for you. I take what God has done for me and I perform righteousness based upon what God has done. But others begin to judge because they of what they've done themselves they say now they ha, say they have the right to judge because they uh, give their tithes because they uh, do good work they preach they evangelize and they see something else and they see these deeds and they think they're going to be saved because of these deeds and now they have the right to judge and it's interesting that when they save they save everyone at once but when they meet with true uh, when they actually meet with true chosen people because these uh, these true people that are chosen they 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 remove this uh this cloak of the old man they immediately send these people to hell or trying to try to send these people to hell because because they don't see this tolerance that they have towards other people in those people that are chosen the tolerance towards sin. When we don't send you to hell, you yourself send yourself to hell with your mouth as you with your mouth confess. From the mouth of a person, by the words of a person, a person will be justified or condemned. All have sinned, there's no difference, and those who do and try to uh, uh, base everything upon their works, and those who do nothing, they're justified freely by the re in redemption of Jesus Christ. Only in the redemption of Jesus Christ, you're justified. And based upon God's laws, God's principles, and God's deeds, not because I'm justified and can do whatever I want now. You know the false charismatic movements, they all shout that they are justified and so forth. And there's no justification there because their justification is based upon lies, on deceit. To be justified, you need to sanctify yourself. Their sanctification are, are encounters, three days encounters. Our sanctification, in accordance to Scripture, while you're living on earth in this mortal body, is a continuous process. It's a process of your whole life and not just three days. There's a big difference between those who have a false uh, orientation of sanctification and those who uh, are basing it on script based on, based on scripture the truth the tenth component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is that when you suffer for the truth you not revile but commit your situation to God as a just judge first Peter 2:23 who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. When we are uh, cr uh, criticized or we are uh, spoken against that we not do this in return, evidence of the fact that we truly are within the boundaries of faithfulness and righteousness is that we are humble and we are trust we entrust ourselves to God. Romans twelve, nineteen through twenty one. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome by evil. When we're talking about the enemy, this is our house, the world. But you never, ever forgive or, or show mercy to the unclean or the devil or your, your own soul. You need to condemn it to death. With those enemies, you don't need to reconcile with them, you don't need to make peace with them because they're condemned to death. Overcoming, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 19 through 21. We need to pl give place to God's uh, vengeance. 
so that our enemies be placed under our feet. <clears throat> the eleventh component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is never justify or defend yourself before God and never demand anything from God, but only plead with Him. Job 9, 14, 15, How then can I answer Him and choose my words to reason with Him? For though I were righteous, I could not answer Him. I would beg mercy for my judge. A person can justify himself often saying this happened because of this and this reasons. The scriptures say do not justify your your wrongful acts before God. That's what it says in another place of scripture. The Holy Spirit speaks through Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 5, 2 through 6. Do not be rash with your mouth and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity, but a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to God, when you oftentimes will hear, oh, what the dream came, that I've had this dream, or I have this dream. And so they, when a person does not lay his uh, troubles upon God, he, he, he worries, and he worries so much, you then fall into different kinds of things and dream different things. And you ask the Lord, why do I have such terrible dreams? It's because there you have too many cares. You did not place them upon the Lord. For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. <clears throat> pay what you have vowed, saying, Lord, forgive me, I didn't think about it, I promised, but I didn't do it. I don't have the ability to do it now. The scriptures say you need to fulfill what you've said. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not lay your mouth do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. A messenger of God Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the works of your hands? This is also a very important component to be within the boundaries of faithfulness and righteousness not to be speed, not be hasty or speedy with your tongue. Think about what you're going to say because people being inspired by emotion saying, I commit, I, I promise, remove your emotions first. You need to dedicate yourself with your mind and will. Leave your emotions behind because emotions went up first. You, you ran after them, you chased after them and uh, do things as they are uh, inspiring you to. When you send your mind and will ahead and the motions follow, then you will do things correctly. The twelfth component of the price for abiding in faithfulness and righteousness is, re is regarding the life of your animal, which symbolizes the caring and regarding of the life of your soul. Proverbs 12.10 A righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Here it's talking about not, of course, not animals physically. You need to care about animals. If anyone has animals, they need, you, need, you know that you need to care for them. If you will not care, uh, for certain animals, especially like uh, cows or other, you will not be able to uh, uh, care for her as she will lose trust in you. And, uh, but what does it mean here? Uh, <clears throat> the, the, these animal, the needs of our, our soul, we need to care about our our souls, what it's talking about, that many animals are the many needs or requirements our soul has that we need to feed and that we need to clean and that we need to continually watch over. We're called to save our soul. Our spirit receives salvation and with our spirit we need to save our body and our soul and for this you need to care for the soul. People sometimes don't care for the soul or care for the body. They treat their body badly and they uh, mistreat it. This is not just a, a, a meaningless thing. This is very important. God paid a price, the price of his uh, of the blood of his of his son Jesus Christ, and uh, people are deceived when they try to. Uh, 
uh, treat their body uh, badly and the life of the animal is also life of the body. We need to care for our body and our soul in accordance to scripture in such a way that they be useful as uh, something you can use for the service of God. Let us bend our knees and our heads, who, however, is comfortable as our time is up, and we will thank God for the word, for that wealth that we were able to receive today. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bow in my spirit before your feet, and I thank you for your truth and your righteousness that you've revealed in your mercy, so that we would have the right to, to your many strengths, to your mercies, so that your mercy would be able to come and we collaborate with it. You want to reveal your mercy. You've done everything so that this mercy could work. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, and had placed upon him all of our sicknesses and weaknesses, our dependences. But for in order for all of this to happen and our weaknesses and sicknesses would disappear, it is necessary for, ha for us to have this righteousness and faithfulness within our heart and present evidence that this righteousness and faithfulness is in our heart. We need to grow them within our heart and we need to strive with our faith to, to your information, to your faith, to your righteousness, the truth that you send so that they can meet together. We thank you for the revelation of your truth and your righteousness. We thank you for your word, for this great treasure that there is, that is priceless and is incomparable because with this word you created the unseen world the angels you created the seen world and the people the physical world and the animals on this earth and all things you hold with your word all these things and you do with the, everything with your word allow us to understand that specifically the, through the confessions of our mouth with the confessions of our mouth we will be justified and condemned to justify ourselves we need to justify ourselves in accordance to your requirement. Give us your wisdom so that we would be able to confess not what our feelings say, not what we see in difficult situations or obstacles, not what the doctors are saying, but what you said in your word. Your word is greater than any verdict of a doctor or any conclusion of a doctor. If you said that you took upon yourself our weaknesses and our sicknesses, then you want our eyes to be upon you and focus upon the fact that they are taken and thank you and begin thanking you for that healing that we have in Jesus Christ and not looking at the fact that many of us are still in slavery but when we will be looking at, the, at how we are free in Jesus Christ and it's placed upon our account and we begin to write all this truth upon the tablets of our heart and confess the faith of our heart and not that what our feelings are feeling or emotions are feeling and this will give you the opportunity to work and through the confessions of our mouth by the confessions of our mouth you will begin to heal your inheritance because you had this intention from the beginning and you will do it you will finish it although thousands of years have passed and your healing as if were sealed but they were not sealed actually because Man did not want to build in his heart this righteousness and faithfulness so that your mercy and healing would be poured out on this, be able to be poured out upon this person. Allow us to understanding these things, to understanding, researching, studying these things, proclaim your truth and righteousness, your faithfulness, so that you would be able to show your many strengths and your mercies so that we can put them on 
May your mercy be blessed for us. Your righteousness and faithfulness, may they not abandon our heart and abide in them. We worship before you, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.